Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for today's webinar of the North Central Region Aging Network. My name is Kelsey Moeller. I'm a member and I work with Purdue University. And I would like to introduce our speaker today for you. This is Dr. Heather Servati Saib, and she is a licensed psychologist and a professor in the doctoral program in counseling psychology. She's currently serving as an associate vice provost for teaching and learning at Purdue University. And then she's also held prior positions um, of associate dean and of an associate dean of student life and honors college and associate head of the Department of Educational Studies. So she's been very well published in the areas of young adult bereavement and suicide social support and grief, and the use of loss as a broad model for conceptualizing significant life events. And today she's going to be um, teaching us and sharing her knowledge on the areas of loss, grief, and mourning. And so we would, um, we are so glad to have you. And if you'd like to begin, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Cassie. And I really appreciated the invitation. Uh, I know it may sound odd in some ways, but I will jump at any opportunity to talk about grief and loss issues. And in a society that is uh, pretty death denying and pretty avoidant of those topics, it makes it even more important, I think, to, to take the chances that we have to have the conversations to talk about these issues. And I think really to learn more about what grief is, what loss is, what how we distinguish, how we understand uh, those concepts, because they're so much a part of our daily lives. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here uh, with a slide that will talk, look at the topics that we're going to be focused on today. So I will talk, as Kelsey said, a bit about loss as a broad concept, because I cannot not do that. So in terms of my own research program, I've done a good bit of research on grief uh, that is death related, but also grief that is more generally loss related. We'll talk through some definitions related to the areas of loss, grief, and mourning, and then talk about some myths, talk about critical factors that are associated with grief and mourning, um, and the possible layers of diversity uh, that, that really exist. Uh, and talk about some contemporary theories of mourning and then the importance of rituals uh, in terms of coping with loss and with grief. I do like to start with some caveats often when I give talks on grief because my focus today is not going to be giving uh, very specific uh, and very uh, explicit uh, direction because part of my message is that grief is so unique and specific to each individual person, that there are actually very few generalities that we can offer about grief uh, and what it might or should or you know, could look like. Uh, in addition, I really wanna push back on, and you'll see this throughout or hear this throughout, push back on the idea that there is one way to grieve. Um, and that there is some universal sort of pattern because we don't see that in the research. There's just so much uniqueness, so much connection for people around their community and their family and how those factors interact with how they grieve in addition to the uniqueness of the loss itself. So we can start by talking about loss. I mean, uh, there's really actually a, an area of psychology called the psychology of loss. Um, and Harvey is one of the big researchers there. This is one of the very first things he wrote a good long while ago, but really the idea of a major loss being a reduction in resources, whether it's tangible or intangible, in which a person has a significant emotional investment. So as human beings, we do often experience loss of what was. It was once, and now it is no longer. Uh, and then we also experience loss of what will never be. There is the potential for someone to grieve what they now see or know will never happen in their lives. Um, and if we were together in a room, I would ask you to generate what are some of those uh, experiences 
that come to mind for you uh, as I make that kind of comment. Some that come to mind to me are things like uh, infertility, maybe being toward the end of life and knowing that there are certain goals or certain activities or certain experiences that a person knows now that they may never experience. And they could grieve the idea that those experiences will not be a part of their life. Those are just a couple of examples. So my students and I have developed something that we call the gain loss framework. And what we argue is that individuals can experience and do experience gains and losses connected to any significant life event. So we're moving beyond just sort of a death focus here to be thinking about different life experiences, whether they are desirable or undesirable, and knowing that either of those types of life experience can be connected to gains and losses both. And that there might be different domains of gain and loss. So there can be gains in some areas of life and losses in other areas of life that are connected to that life event. Let's pick, for example, aging. As we age, that is a life experience. As individuals get older, there are certain gains that come with being older. And again, I would ask you to generate those. If you want to generate those, some of those in the chat, that would be wonderful. Some of the gains that come with the process of aging, and then some of the losses that come with the process of aging. I will say it's not been all that long that I have had to wear these glasses. <laughs> so the loss of my vision as I age is very, very real. Um, so I'm seeing in the chat, you know, experience. People gain experience with age. They gain wisdom. They gain memories. They might have more free time. Absolutely. What are some losses that might go along with the aging process? Loss of friends. Yes. Family members. So there we are thinking about death in those ways, but also loss of abilities. Thank you. Loss of jobs. There may not, after retirement, we could pick retirement as a very particular piece, perhaps of the aging process and the gains and losses that go with retirement. Purpose might come with that. Loss of freedom, loss of independence. Excellent, excellent examples. So you're getting this sense of how useful the concept of loss can be beyond just thinking about it in terms of a death-related situation or experience. So then what we argue as a part of this gain-loss framework is that it's a shifting perception. So we might have different gains or losses we experience as we start the aging process, and then those changes, those change over time. There's different gains. There's different losses. When we experience a death loss, there may be immediate losses that we perceive that shift and change and immediate gains. Like, like for example, if a person dies who was in, in significant pain, an immediate gain is that they are no longer in that pain. And I'm not arguing that the gains somehow overcome the losses. What I'm, what I'm saying is that as human beings, we are quite capable of holding both. And it becomes problematic when we're working with individuals and we're helping them to consider their own life experiences that we only focus on one side. Because I would truly argue that most significant life events really do have both. So we argue that all events, you know, have it. There's gains that we argue that the gains are positively associated with well-being. So that when we are working with individuals and we can watch for windows of gain, we don't give them a lecture about gains. You know, that's not helpful. But listening carefully for someone being able to offer perhaps a lesson that was learned, perhaps an intrapersonal element like wisdom that is learned. You know, we watch for the windows so that we can help people see that their experience is really about holding both. And when we have life experiences, sometimes being able to help someone to distinguish or consider the multiple losses that they are experiencing can be quite validating because we have these life experiences and it can be confusing for people to say, why am I responding so strongly to this? Why am I having such a challenging time? And it's because it isn't a singular life event. It is actually an event that involves multiple losses. So being able to talk through what are the losses that are a part of this life experience can again, be quite helpful um, and validating for people. Now, the perception of these gains and losses is, is unique to each person. So if we have 
there we go. So to, to, uh, to have two individuals even who have experienced what might externally be seen as the same life event, say a divorce or the ending of a romantic partnership, that may look very similar to society from the outside, but the gains and losses that each of those people connect and perceive related to that divorce will be quite distinct from one another. So we really believe that this framework can be quite meaningful in helping people to understand the uniqueness of their response to particular life events. So it also needs to be understood through the person in context. So the context of their family, the context of their community, the context of their culture, um, the different cultures that they consider themselves to be a part of and how they see this perception of the gains and losses within those within those contexts. I remember I gave a talk once to a group of people here on campus um, at Purdue, and I was not aware that many of the people in the audience were partners. Um, and they filled out our measure that we have that's associated with this framework. And if we were in person, I would have you complete it. Um, but if people are interested, you know, please do reach out to me and I'd be glad to share the measure um, that really taps into the this gain loss framework. And there was a woman who was present who had recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's and she completed our measure and so did her husband about the same life event. And she shared with me later in the day that they had had a conversation about their perception of the gains and losses associated with her Parkinson's and that her husband was quite upset that she had actually indicated gains associated with her Parkinson's. And those gains were really in the, the items that we call existential within this measure. So things like purpose in life, things like the, the preciousness of time and the appreciation of relationships. And some of those pieces were the ones that she really perceived gains. Um, and he, of course, had not because it was a unique perception that they each had of this life experience. So just to offer a little more about loss as a broad concept, when we're talking with people about loss, it's helpful to sometimes be able to distinguish what are the physical losses versus what are the psychosocial losses. So physical losses are just what they sound like. They are losses that are tangible. We can sense them with our sensory systems, you know, so they are losses like, so if we were so then psychosocial losses are just the opposite. They are losses of things that we cannot touch, we cannot see, we cannot hear, for example. So when a person dies, there are many physical losses that are a part of that life experience. We lose the ability to hug them. We lose the ability to hear their voice. We lose the ability to smell their smell. And those are powerful losses. Um, and if you're talking with individuals who are grieving a death loss, they will talk about how powerful those physical losses are. Then we also have psychosocial losses, those that are not tangible, right? The unconditional support that someone in our lives may have provided to us, the roles they played in our lives. We could go on, the, the future that we had planned for them and the future elements that are now lost. All of that speaks again to the complexity, not in a way to bring people down, but in a way to help people to have more insight regarding the extent to which their grief is appropriate. Um, and those can be applied to non-death loss situations as well, but uh, I'm offering you know, the death loss as an example there. Secondary losses is just another term, are losses that, that tend to, to span out from the original event or the original loss. So you see the drops of water there. It's as if the main life event, say it's retirement, right, is the main life event, then what are the rippled losses that come from that? Perhaps there is a loss of purpose, like was mentioned earlier. Perhaps there is a loss of, of even friendships that were contexted in the employment setting. Uh, so those are secondary losses. And some of those may be just as or more impactful than the original sort of loss or life event itself. So that it can be helpful to raise that for people to have a gain, gain a sense of understanding regarding that element of the complexity. Disenfranchised grief 
is a really important concept within the field of death and dying that I think you all would also appreciate. And that is grief that is not recognized or acknowledged by society. And oftentimes it can be because of the griever. It, it can be not acknowledged because of the relationship and it can be not acknowledged for the loss itself. So when we think about grievers, um, and we can relate this to, to older adults very easily because often ad older adults, their grief is disenfranchised. Sometimes society will sort of send this direct or indirect message that you're so old, you have so much wisdom, you've experienced so many losses that we don't really need to respond or support you in your grief because you got grief, you got this grief thing, you know how to do it. So they can become disenfranchised grievers just because they are older adults. Children are often disenfranchised grievers. And I might mention this a few times during our time together, but I mean, that would be a whole nother talk, right? In terms of children's grief. Um, I could actually give a whole nother talk just on older adult grief and the uniqueness there. Um, but this time today is, is, is more of a broad overview. D grief can also be disenfranchised because of the relationship with the person who died say it's a, it's a, it is a death loss so co-workers are often disenfranchised grievers friends can be disenfranchised grievers by society there are assumptions about the closeness or the connection with someone that can come when all we do is look at the formal relationship between the individuals sometimes relationships are disenfranchised in life so if we have an LGBTQ related relationship, that is often disenfranchised in life. So it is often disenfranchised in death and in the grieving process as well. Society doesn't acknowledge it, doesn't recognize it, therefore doesn't offer support. The loss itself can be connected to the disenfranchised grief because the loss is not recognized. So miscarriage, for example, can be a disenfranchised loss that then is connected to disenfranchised grief the death of a pet. Um, uh, there can be a whole range of non-death loss experiences where the grief is disenfranchised because so much, again, of our society perceives grief as only associated with death when really the concept is much, much broader. And even, as I've been sharing, even in the context of death, there are so many layers of the loss that are important to acknowledge, recognize, uh, and validate. That is a lot of what I'm offering to you today is how more information about what grief and mourning is can make a difference in how you enfranchise someone's experience, how you do acknowledge and recognize the depth of, of what they are experiencing. So let's talk a little bit about some definitions. So bereavement as a term is actually defined as the state of having experienced loss. So it is. it can also be used as a broad term. You can be in a state of bereavement in connection to many life events. We often do connect it again back to death, but it is much broader than that. But it is the state of being. We don't say that someone is bereaving. It's not a verb. It is a state of being. Grief is the passive and involuntary responses that we have as humans to the state of bereavement. So we don't really choose how we grieve. It is involuntary, it is passive. We simply experience it. And grief is actually multidimensional. One of my biggest sort of soapboxes and everyone who is a friend, colleague, family member of mine knows that this is one of my soapboxes. Grief is absolutely positively not equal to sadness. It is not even equal to emotions. When we're talking about grief, it is multidimensional. It is emotional, right? But it is just as much confusion and anger as it is sadness, for example. It depends on the person. It is cognitive. It is physiological, it is social, it is spiritual. Grief affects all of our domains of functioning. That's why it's so overwhelming. 
because it really functions, it really interacts and engages all of the ways that we live and experience as human beings. It is absolutely multidimensional. It is also a continuing development. Uh, grief actually doesn't end. Let me say that again. Like grief doesn't actually end, but that does not mean that it stays the same. It actually shifts and changes over time. It is a continuing development for the individuals who are experiencing it. So one of my favorite quotes about grief is from one of the key philosophers of our modern day, Keanu Reeves, who said, grief never ends, it changes shape. Grief never ends, it changes shape. And I just love that quote because it gets to this, this multi-dimensional, the three-dimensional even nature of grief and how it shifts and changes and holds space in our lives. I don't say that grief doesn't end again as a discouragement. It is an honoring. Grief is an honoring and a recognition of attachment and love. It can be connected to a person, but it can also be attachment to other elements of our life, other aspects of our life experience that we have some kind of attachment to. It is natural and expectable. It is a reaction to all types of losses. And just as loss is uniquely perceived, losses and gains are uniquely perceived, grief is uniquely experienced. So the way that you connect gains and losses to any particular life event will then connect back to the gratitude in terms of the gains and the loss in, in the grief in connection with the losses. It's really, it's really both of those being very unique um, and specific to each person. So I also like to say that grief is unique based on who you are as a person and your unique relationship with the person who died. If my brother were to die today, I have two sisters as well. And the grief that we have would be unique because of who we are, but also unique because we each have very specific and unique relationships with him. So grievers can often think, why are we not all grieving the same? We lost the same person, but you didn't lose the same relationship. You didn't. You're grieving unique relationships, and that adds to the uniqueness of the grief. So oftentimes when we work with grieving families, my students and I ran a support group for grieving families for a number of years, and we would say one of the goals for this experience is for you to recognize and respect the different ways in which each of you are and will be grieving over time. So mourning is distinct from grief. Grief is passive and involuntary. We don't choose it. We don't say, okay, today I'm gonna to be confused and tomorrow I'm gonna to have a headache. That's my plan. That's my plan for grief. Um, no, but mourning is active and voluntary. Mourning is actually our attempt as grievers, as those in a state of bereavement, to cope with our state of loss and with our experience of grief. It is the coping part. It is active, it is voluntary. It is the choices that we have and the actions that we can take within the space of loss and grief to try to reorient ourselves to life now that this loss has occurred, to integrate this loss into our life experience into our life narrative, which I'll talk a bit about more later, to adapt to the world now that this loss has occurred, whether the loss is connected to a person dying or to another significant life experience. I want to emphasize, and this gets a little bit into the myths already, I think that's our next slide though, is that grief is not, and mourning is not about recovery or resolution, okay? Recovery implies that grief is a sickness, and it is not a sickness. It is natural. It is expectable. It is normative. We grieve. It is a normal process. So saying that we recover from it is not really a good fit. And the idea of resolution, you would also already have a sense, because I do not believe or see or experience or the literature does not indicate that grief actually ends. It shifts and changes. So the idea that it would resolve is also not a good fit. So let's move on to the myths. 
the myths, the first myth that I would want to offer about grief and also mourning, because they can be connected in this way, is that someone has to be sad, someone has to emote, someone has to be highly distressed when they're grieving. Actually, people grieve in a number of different ways. Uh, and there is no indication in the literature that people must cry. I just want I want to emphasize that again. This can come as quite a quite an interesting sort of uh, you know push push in a way. Um, what we see actually is individuals who are most distressed immediately after a death loss are those that are most distressed all along the way, because grief is a continuing development and is not a a sickness or an illness, it's not something that you get out. It's not something that if I'm, 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 if I'm, if I'm substan substantively enough distressed, if I am emoting enough, then I will get done with my grief. It doesn't really work that way. Um, people grieve very, very differently. For some individuals, being emotive and and being distressed is an absolute understandable a part of their experience based on who they are as an individual. Their, again, their family, their community, their culture, and for others, it is not. Uh, and again, I'll come back to that concept in, an, in another way uh, as we move forward. The idea of resolution and recovery, I've already shared a bit about that. There is a diagnosis in DSM now, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, that uses grief. Um, it, is, uh, it is a very distinct condition but it is not normative grief. Um, and if you do look it up or you work in a setting where this would be the case, um, I do believe there's something in that diagnosis, but I would not call it grief. It is a very distinct experience that individuals have after a death loss. So grief to me is normative by definition. There's also a, a significant myth um, and one that I really want to emphasize for you, that there is some linear projection or path that must be followed in terms of grief being appropriate or being successful. Um, if we were in a room, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you've heard of Kubler-Ross. Kubler I would imagine that many of you have. Kubler-Ross's work was phenomenal. She was she was a game changer, right? I would not be doing the work I'm doing. There would not be a field of what we call thanatology, which is the study of death and dying without her work. But her work has absolutely been misapplied. Even in her 1980, or 1969 book, if you look to the foreword, it indicates that her the stages that she offers in that book were never meant to be a prescription or an indication of what must occur. And she studied dying people, not grieving people. Um, and so her theory has been misapplied in many, many ways. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that we have no indication in the research that grief moves in any kind of linear path. It's much more dynamic and messy than that, which is hard for people to hear, um, but is important, I think, as we communicate with them to know that they're not doing it wrong if they're not following Kubler-Ross's stages. And actually, I never give a grieving person Kubler-Ross's stages. I never even talk about it. And if they've heard about it, I will push back in my conversation with them to make certain that they are not adding layers to their grief in their belief that somehow they're not doing it correctly. Grief really needs to be a very personal experience where an individual does what is compelling for them and does not do what is not compelling for them. And we cannot tell them that. All we can do is facilitate the conversation that helps them to find what is compelling for me in my grief and what is not compelling for me in my grief. You know, if we look at th three elements that are there in many, many stage theories that exist related to grief, we will see that there is some sort of element of shock, right, and disbelief at the beginning of the grief process. That's well-founded very understanding. Then there will be some kind of segment that is about pain, however the theorist has conceptualized pain. And then there will be some element that is about moving forward in some way. And I'm very careful in the way I say that. I don't say moving on because that suggests forgetting, right? Or the idea of resolution, but how do we move forward, right? And so often theories will have that element in them as well.
So I've been referring to how unique grief is. Uh, I've touched on some of these already, but, but some of them not. So issues of diversity, culture, and religion definitely interact with how someone will experience their grief. Um, I'm not going to tell you how. I'm not going to give you a list of ways. These are areas to be mindful of in terms of our understanding of how individuals grieve. But the way each of these intersect with the experience of grief, again, is very unique to each person. The cultural, the current, and historical external influences. So if we talk about African-American Black uh, in folks within our culture, there's generational grief that exist for them based on the history of slavery, the history of, of, of significant death losses that are shared generationally over time within families. Uh, and that adds to the grief. Uh, often the way that death occurs in our society, Black individuals are much more likely to die of violent death losses. That interacts with the experience of, of, of an individual's grief oftentimes, the broader perspective of, of how deaths often occur within the Black community. Daily discrimination can be connected to experiences of grief. How is it that some individuals um, of different cultures, different races, different um, sexual orientations are allowed to grieve or not? We could go back to disenfranchised grief. We could, we could raise a concept called suffocated grief that my good colleague Tichelle Bordeaux has talked about, where within the Black community, there is, um, by society, there is this messaging, not just of disenfranchised grief, but this messaging of your grief is not allowed at all. It needs to be, it, it needs to be suffocated. It is suffocated by society. There is an action that is, is very direct um, in, in those situations. I offered about the relationship with the person who died. Was it primarily a positive relationship? Was it primarily a negative relationship? One of my students and I did a research study. It was her dissertation on individuals who'd experienced the death of their sexual abuser. That is a very complicated relationship and very complicated grief. Again, a whole nother talk, perhaps. Circumstances surrounding the death. What was the cause of death? Was it sudden? Was it extended? Not to say that a sudden death is harder than an extended illness death. I would never say that, actually. Is it harder to have a loved one die suddenly without the opportunity to say goodbye to them? Or is it harder to watch your loved one physically deteriorate in front of you? We're not going to have that argument. The issue is the uniqueness that comes with the grief connected to each or either one of those death situations. What are their personal responses to loss? What's their personal loss history? Whether it's death loss or non-death loss history, how is the family approaching the death loss? Is there communication about the person who died? Is communication about the person who died not allowed? Um, how, is, how, are the, how is general functioning occurring within the family system? Are they having to try to care for one another um, in the midst of, of really significant grief when they're debilitated themselves. And then developmental level, which I mentioned children and older adults, adolescents, young adults, as Kelsey mentioned, are a very particular uh, developmental group as well that are often disenfranchised and not considered uh, for who they are very specifically uh, and developmentally. So that's another uh, sort of, again, critical factor to consider. Now, the next two slides are taken, these items and questions are taken from a book by my good colleague, um, uh, Judith Murray. She is an Australian psychologist and, and grief researcher. And what she offers to us is a list of questions about possible layers of diversity related, not just to death loss, but to loss in general. And if we were in the room together, I would ask Again, which of these resonate? Which of them jump out to you as being connected to loss and to grief? All right. So how are the how are certain losses compared to other losses within a culture, within a community? Who has the power to affect the loss or the grieving of it? You know, who, uh, who allows what sorts of expressions can occur or not? How do different groups and communities and cultures explain the causes and beliefs about losses uh, and about deaths? All important questions. Here are some more 
really important questions. The structure of the social network around the griever. How structured is it, right? How, uh, how far does it extend? uh how, what's the what is the communal nature of the of the of the community like how far is a nuclear family member considered right in many collectivistic cultures cousins are siblings like they are that tight that close that much connected uh and so therefore the losses extend you know in terms of what would be considered significant loss much beyond what might be defined as a nuclear family of solely parents and siblings, or even grandparents. Mm -hmm. How long can a grieving person grieve? And that will be dictated often in terms of layers of diversity. Again, I'm sending that message of how complex grief is. It is not about a stage theory. If it was, wow, you know, grief would be so much more manageable. It really isn't. And I often find that when individuals um, have been exposed to stage theories, it actually harms them more than it helps them. And I know that's a very strong statement, but I really need to make it because it creates this sense of, I must do it in this one single way. Uh, and th that can't be further from the truth. So really what is true is the dynamicness. So there is not universality of stage theories. There's a shifting away from the idea that we must or should let go, which really came originally from Freud, who actually changed his thinking about that after he experienced his own significant death losses. It's an unfolding over time. There is an attention to meaning making and identity, like who am I as a person and how is that connected to how I grieve and how I make sense of the losses that I'm experiencing. And then there's also this increased appreciation of the possibility of life enhancing spirituality and personal growth, which goes back again, I believe, to our gain loss framework around how those elements can also be connected to non-death loss experiences. And then very much this beyond the individual focus and more attention to culture, diversity and familial context. So what are some of the theories that do this? I, I wish I, I could do, a, again, a whole nother talk just on these four, um, but you can look any of these up if, if some of them really resonate for you and you think that really fits with how, how I consider grief and how I think about the work I do with the individuals that I work with. So continuing bonds is really a direct pushback against the idea of letting go. What we see in the literature is, and the research, is that those who continue some sort of connection with the loved one who died, which can happen in a number of different ways, actually tend to function better. Um, I remember that, you know, people share all kinds of experiences with me, um, but, but one within my own family was when my father-in-law died, one of my mother-in-law's friends called my husband and said, oh, your mom, I don't know how she's doing, right? She's like writing messages to your dad. She, I don't know how she's doing. And my husband proceeded to educate her about grief. Um, and I was in the other room and it was quite a moment for me where I was like, wow, he really does listen to me. He really has taken in, you know, this information about what grief is and what it isn't. Writing a letter to an individual who died that is an act of mourning. It is a constructive, positive act of mourning. It is not an indication of some kind of dysfunction or, or, or indication of concern. So some sort of connection. Patterns of grief gets back to the idea that grief looks very different and, and can look very different from person to person. So the two patterns that Doka and Martin talk about most are intuitive grief and instrumental grief. Intuitive grief is what we might consider as the more um, traditional, stereotypical, maybe even feminine approach to grief, if we think about gender role socialization. So more emotive, more wanting to talk, more wanting to, to feel and be in community and connection with others um, in relationship to the grief. And instrumental grief is more about action. It's more about cognition. It's more about thinking and acting in the grieving space um, and in the mourning space, like I might act in a way. So for intuitive grief, you know, grief groups often work great for intuitive grievers because they want to be discussing grief. They do not work great for, for instrumental 
grievers. And again, if we go back to the traditional gender role socialization, uh, Doka and Martin offer that it's possible for more men to be instrumental, but I'll share that I'm more an instrumental than I am an intuitive griever. Um, and so we don't wanna make judgment about that either. But instrumental grief can look like, you know, uh, a father fixing a fence that was run down when his child hit that fence and died, right? In a, in a car accident, that is instrumental grief. Um, and I would argue that it's no more or less effective, and the research would support this, than being in a support group and talking about what you're feeling. Um, and another example from the grieving families that we worked with was a father who went through our program and did an activity where each of the group members picked a rock that somehow reminded them of the person that died. And he told us a year later when he came back to share about the experience with our next group of, of facilitators that he kept that rock in his pocket every day. He would take it out every night, put it on his nightstand, and every morning when he woke up, put on his pants, he would put that rock back in his pocket. That is an act of grieving. It's an act of mourning. It's an action. Um, and I would not argue you know, and I would, you know, not suggest to anyone that they argue that that is not an appropriate and meaningful act of mourning. The dual process model of grief is focused on how when we experience the death of a person, we lose them, right? So that's a loss stressor. We lose their physical being, right? We also lose all the ways that they contributed to our lives in a practical way. So we have both of these kinds of stressors, and then we need to cope with both of those kinds of stressors. So I must cope as a griever with the idea that I can no longer hug the person who died, you know, right? I can no longer be supported by them in, in that physical comforting sort of way, but I also can no longer count on them to cook the meals. So the restoration oriented is about how do I move forward in my life? having to deal with those restoration oriented stressors. And what the what Stroiba should argue is it's really an oscillation between those two. We can't stay just in the loss and we can't stay just in the restoration. We really need to be able to do both. Um, and that's often permission giving to grieving people. You know, I don't describe it to them in this, you know, lofty way, I really describe to them the idea of, you know, many things have changed and there's many different kinds of changes that you're coping with. You're coping with the changes of not having them here, right? Just the essence of them. And you're also coping with, you know, the idea of moving forward in your life without them and what that means. The last theory I want to emphasize is the one perhaps that has the most research associated with it because there's a lot of measures related to it. So a lot of my research team, um, a lot of my work and my students' work has used this theory of meaning reconstruction and loss. And what Niemeyer argues is that as human beings, we really live in story. We really have constructed our lives mentally. This is how our life will look. This is this is what I am about. This is what the future will be about. This is how the world works. And when you experience a significant death loss, when we experience a significant death loss, it's as if someone has put a fist through the web. So the picture of the web here of our understanding of the world. Let me say that again. It's almost as if someone has put a fist through the web of our understanding of the world and how it works. And the process of mourning, right, is the attempt to reconnect those threads. It is an attempt to make the web whole again, the web of our understanding whole again, but it will never look the same. It may be whole, but it will never look the same again. And the idea that we will never think about ourselves the same, perhaps. We will never think about the future the same, perhaps. And the idea that if we go back to the idea of story and narrative, grieving people often appreciate the idea that, you know, you kind of had outlines of the future chapters of your life story. 
And now that this person is no longer physically present, the outlines of those chapters must be rewritten. The process of mourning is a process. It is not a stage theory to be negotiated. It is a very active, intentional process where we need to think about ourselves and the future and our understanding of the world and reconstruct the, that story, reconstruct those chapters, right? Reconstruct our understanding of who we are, what this person meant to our lives, how they affected who we are as an individual and how they can continue to still be a part of our lives, but not in the same way that they were. So when we think about meaning reconstruction, when we think about coping, we often think about rituals. Rituals are an act of mourning. They are often very active, very voluntary, very involved. Uh, and when we think about rituals related to death, we think about funerals and we think about memorial services. They are the primary ritual for death. Um, and we, there is some research that indicates people's participation and in, in involvement is associated with, with better adjustment. Uh, although the things that individuals do after, the rituals after a funeral may be even more important. Uh, and they're much more about, it's much more about the person's perception than it is related to any facts about the service. Sometimes what I'll say to grieving people is just look for nuggets that you can take out of the service. You may not appreciate the whole service. The whole service cannot be perfect and it cannot be a perfect match for what is meaningful for every person in attendance. It just can't be. Um, it is a, it's a amalgamation, right, of all different sorts of elements that will be meaningful to different people. Um, and so finding your sense of meaning and connection, at least a couple of nuggets, right, and also expecting that there will be pieces of it that you, that don't fit, that you might even consider as not appropriate, but being able to know that, that there also will likely be pieces that will be helpful. Oftentimes, grave goods are important. Clothing, eyeglasses, jewelry, photos, letters. When my maternal grandmother, I mean, my paternal grandmother died, one of my aunts baked bread and put it in the casket with her. That was a really powerful grave good. The whole church smelled like my grandma's bread. Right? Go back to the sensory sort of piece and how powerful that is oftentimes for us in the grief and mourning process. I want to just throw out this idea that when we're talking with individuals about coping, about mourning, about ritual, um, that ritual is not limited to funerals and memorial services. The whole idea of ritual is so creative and has such potential power. We can create rituals as individuals whenever we want in connection to whatever type of loss it might be. If it is the loss of a person, if it is the loss of uh, related to a, a, another non another significant life event that has losses connected to it, the important components of developing a ritual that is more personal is that there are symbols. It somehow has emotional ex expression, perhaps. It's somehow structured and time limited. It may involve reminiscing about the person who died, and it may allow us to emphasize that ongoing relationship and connection with the person who died, even again, though they are not physically uh, with us any longer. There's really no culturally common approach to post-funeral rituals. Oftentimes they're hidden. People don't often even realize they're engaging in, in rituals. Like for example, taking a walk every day that the person who died used to take, that is a ritual. It is a very powerful act of mourning that can be even more meaningful if it's brought to the person's attention. The meaningfulness to the individual is it's such an important part of it. Um, and they're very transitional in nature. Some of it is about the balance of moving in and out of the person's absence, right? So on that walk, someone may uh, feel a sense of sadness that the person is no longer with them on that walk, but also a continued sense of connection that they can still take this walk and feel this sense of, um, uh, in community with the person, um, even again, though they, are have, they, though they have died. Action and behavioral elements are quite critical. 
So a ritual for me, I will share as part of my instrumental grief is I, I took a, a, up a hobby that was related to an important person who died. I have strawberries every year on April 15th. And it is absolutely an annual memorial act on my part. It is an, is it a ritual that's very meaningful? Um, and those kinds of things can be re-experiencing and reworking through the grief and the mourning and rediscovering and reshaping the memory of, of that death and the person who died and our understanding of their relationship with them. It's so interesting and amazing that our relationship with those who die can actually shift and change over time through the acts of mourning that we can continue to engage in. Um, and rituals are very much a part of that. So just to summarize, and hopefully there'll be an opportunity to have a question or two maybe in the chat or, or unmuting, the take home points really here are that loss is a broad concept. I mean, we it's connected to death, absolutely it is, um, but it's much more useful than being limited to being connected to death and dying situations. Grief is normative, it's dynamic, it's multidimensional. Mourning is active, ongoing, right? Fluid and very idiosyncratic and specific to individuals. Grievers grieve as individuals within their cultural and familial contexts. Uh, and our work is really to seek understanding of their individual grief and their individual mourning process without judging it. Um, you know, one of the big problems is when we think that the, our way of grieving is the way that grief must or should be. Um, it's, it's just not the case. It's our way, but it's not the universal or general way. And then rituals are so powerful for coping and for meaning making uh, within the context of death losses, but also within the context of those significant life events that involve losses and, and gains. So really appreciated being able to be here and share uh, some of this information with you. And I truly hope that it is useful to you. I wanna mention that at the beginning in the first slide, I shared my email. If I can be helpful to you, just let me know how you, how you learned about me or learned about the work. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out if I can be useful to you. My email again is the first part of my last name, servati at purdue.edu. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Kelsey. Um, and I do see actually a comment in the chat about divorce. Um, yeah, absolutely. I had, mm -hmm. I had shared that when you were asking, um, you know, about different types of loss. Yes. That that's often one um, I know as professionals and educators teaching yeah. maybe family programming or things like yeah. that, where mm -hmm. sometimes the stages have been incorporated into that a little bit as, as a way um, to deal with that loss. So mm -hmm. I, I know I learned so much in talking with you and speaking with you about that. Um, yeah. So anything yeah. you want to share on that? I would love to share one, a couple of pieces there. When we did our study on the gain loss framework, and we were we were we looked at a whole range of life events when we were developing that framework, and one of the life events we looked at was divorce. And when we piloted the measure, divorce was one or, or the ending of a romantic partnership was one of the most common life events indicated, and it was the life event that had the most diversity with regard to the losses and gains that people connected to it. So the idea that a universal stage theory could work for divorce is actually counterindicated from our, from our work because the unique perception of divorce is so specific to the person um, that a stage theory is not really a very good fit at all for that experience. Yeah, it's more these other theories that I offered, which are death related, but can, can be applied. How do you rewrite the future chapters, right? The outlines of those future chapters. Now that this life event has occurred, how do you make sense of who you are? How do you reconstruct your understanding of love, right? Or how the world works, you know? Those are the kinds of, I think, questions and encouragement that we wanna be offering back to people. I see that you, you know, Molly, did you have a question or comment? 
No, I was, I don't have a question, but I, yeah. this was fabulous, by the way, Heather, very, I've taught about grief for men. I've worked as an educator for 30 years and I've taught about grief, but I've learned so much in the last hour, honestly. And I wish that every family had an opportunity to even get these basic definitions, because I think um, in the context of family relationships, there is not an understanding of grief as an individualized experience. Yeah. Um, grief yeah. is a universal concept. Everyone does grieve, but yes. no one grieves in the same way is what my takeaway from today. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's really important because my dad died four years ago this in two days it'll be the fourth anniversary and my mom's been gone for 18 years but as a family mm -hmm. we were all grieving but we were not all grieving in the same way yet we had undoubtedly the same amount of love for our, our father and you know yeah. so and it it came through in a few ways never in a mm -hmm. in a bad way but you know my a couple of my siblings were ready to start going through the house two weeks later and you know, I've taught about, you know, aging issues, grief issues, and I just think I would be the most enduring, and I was the, I was the pothole, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. um, so it is really universal for everyone. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes. unique for everyone. It is very unique. And a universal concept. So. Yeah. yeah, and I think when we worked with the grieving families, that that is often what they told us, is that we learned how to respect mm -hmm. the differences Mm -hmm. among our grief mm -hmm. and not to judge them right not to not to question them but to try to figure out how to best negotiate mm -hmm. supporting each other and sometimes when push comes to shove you know grieving family members are not the best at supporting each other yeah. they're they're just affected by their own grief right. and the, the, it's often important to have network outside of the family for each person Absolutely. so you know when we were doing that with kids you know we were like who are the other people in this kid's life who can support their grief? That isn't you, mom. That isn't you, dad, because they need those other outlets. Um, oftentimes it was an uncle or a neighbor or I mean, it, sometimes they did have friends who could be present. But often kids have a hard time being present with each other when the emotions and the and the experience is so deep. So well, I learned today that, you know, my siblings by them really wanting to work to get that done. Mm -hmm. It was an actor of, ins of instrumental. <laughs> so, and maybe some, ins maybe some restoration as well in terms of right, moving forward. It was forward. a lot of love and we never, you know, obviously we were all on the same page and loved each other through it, but we yeah. weren't all in the same place. So that was harder, it's still loving, but harder. And the mm -hmm. last thing I'm going to say, when I was 12, I experienced my first family death, my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll never forget my grandma saying, I wish I could cry. I should be crying. She said, but I don't cry. She said, I wish I could cry because I feel like I need to, but I can't. Yeah. So I, you know, that was also very, yeah, very important concept. In Thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. Thanks so much, Molly. Because I felt that same sort of thing, even in the work I do and the information that I have. I had a friend tell me once, oh, grieving must be so much easier for you. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, um, but I have felt that own my own sort of self judgment that I should be crying, but that isn't that isn't that doesn't tend to be my way of moving in the world, you know. Right. Um, but but did I was I instrumental? Absolutely, was I instrumental in my grief? I mean, very much connected to how I could take that grief and channel it into ways that even also might help others. I mean, which we see that a lot, right? Absolutely. Mothers against drunk driving. That is a phenomenal act of instrumental grief sure. that we would never judge, right? right. Absolutely. Very functional. Mm -hmm. This was great. Thank you. You're great. Yeah, I would echo you, what Molly said. I've learned so much. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. And um, we have also a handout that I know Heather shared. It's called the Grief Indicators, and that'll be listed as a resource. Um, so it goes into some of those indicators that she referred to in the presentation. So we'll be sure to get that uploaded as well. And thank you so much for, for sharing today with us.
Well, I really appreciate the invitation, Kelsey. As I said, like, this is my passion. This is my calling, right? So I, when I have the opportunity to, to share and to be engaged with others on these topics, I'm going to jump at it. So thanks so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Everybody have a good day. Thanks. You too. Have a nice weekend. Never.